The following program is rated BBMALSA. It contains strong language, sexual situations, awesomeness, and nudity. It is intended only for mature audiences. Listener indiscretions are advised. Welcome to our Bliss Bringers podcast. The materials we cover encourage adults of all ages, nationalities, and sexualities to open up and embrace their wildest desires and blissful pleasures. You won't find medical advice here, just our personal experiences following the journey of sexual evolution and education in sizzling fun topics that were definitely not taught to us in school, but have wickedly blossomed into reality. We discuss adventures in ethical non-monogamy, kinks and fetishes, exotic places to visit, sexy events, workshops, and tips allow us to seduce you into embarking on new adventures where each day you ask yourself what's your pleasure welcome back everybody this is john i'm mr cindy and today we will be talking about the event called dark odyssey surrender 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 to me in san francisco we were there in november and what all did we see there? There was three days of things going on. I saw naked butts. <laughs> yes, we saw a lot of those. We saw various trainings and events. And there was a lot of introductory kink play sessions, which I really appreciate because there's so many new things. I went to a, a fisting session and it was led by two girls. And that was really, really interesting. And I went to... A couple sessions, the ones that stick out in my mind are, one was scene negotiation, and I went to one with regarding rough sex, and we went together for a erotic writing one. So it's a little bit of everything that you get there. Did you know that book publishers actually censor out words? Yeah. I had no idea. The guy that led that class, Erotic Writing, enlightened us saying that publishers today, when you write books, they censor out the words. You won't see fucking in there. Like those naughty books that my grandma and my mom used to read, and they were just mysteries, but it was always about the woman getting ravaged. and This half-naked man on the cover of a yes. cheap paperback yes. that sold in the train station. My Christian grandmother had a library of those books, and I stole one of those books and read it when I was 16. And did you masturbate to it? I did. How'd you know? <laughs> well, Geely, we whiskers. <laughs> but it was talking about fucking this woman in the Sahara Desert. She had been kidnapped from England, and you know, it was it was just it was really hot. But apparently, they don't have those naughty words in the books anymore. That's the Puritans for you. And what else did we do? Uh, we visited some of the vendors. This year, they put the vendors up on one of the top floors, so it was out of the main floor, mainstream area. I don't know if they got the traffic, but I did really like how they separated them per room. So that way you could go in and out of the rooms and stuff. And they had some great items. Yeah. So they were up, upstairs all in the, each in their own room or two in a room. Mm -hmm. And then they also did like little demonstrations in the main room when there was stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Friday night. I remember getting zapped by a pinwheel attached to a violet wand, which left marks. It looked like a trail. Yes. Kind of like, like a dotted line. Oh, I was thinking like a snail trail that had burned into your arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you had some interesting experiences with a whip. Yeah, there was a table. I can't remember which organization. It may have been Janice. I can't remember. But anyhow, I went up because they had a table full of whips, and, you know, they've been calling my name. I kind of want to learn how to use the whip so I can whip your ass when you need to be whipped. <laughs> right. Uh, so I started asking the gentleman questions. Well, he thought I was interested in learning to the feel, the sensation of the whip on my skin. Not how to throw the whip, but how to, I guess, breathe through the whip. <laughs> well, you know, the best doms are those who subbed first to the same thing, right? Yeah, that's old school. That's definitely old school. Yes, that is true. So then what happened? Well, he took me behind the table and he you know, he says, oh, well, come here. And he was very helpful, only that I started to realize when he spread my arms and legs open wide and had me brace myself against the wall, he was not going to teach me how to throw the whip. He was going to do more than just teach me how to throw the whip. He was going to teach me how to receive the whip. <laughs> 
So you know what? He was really, really good because he actually did not touch my skin for several times. What he did is he was introducing the whip by just letting me hear a little bit of air popping next to my ears and then around my shoulder blades. And it didn't touch me until, and he was talking me through it and he, he was encouraging me with the breathing, which is always very good. Breathing is good. Breathing is very good, especially when my toes are curled waiting for that snap. And that's when he started to introduce the popping of the whip and there was a crack in my ear and I hate loud sounds and my whole body stiffened up and he came up and he was encouraging me and motivating me saying, oh, that was good. That was good. And then there was this hot flash on my back at, at the same time as the crack and he kissed my skin with his whip. And how was that? You know, it wasn't too bad. It went three times. On the third time, I put my hand up and said, okay, I'm done, because it <laughs> felt like somebody just popped me with a hot iron or something. It I'm was, not that curious anymore. It was hot. I mean, it was sexy hot, but it just felt like something was burning on my skin. And what I loved about it, he was very gentle. He came up and he put his hand on my back and he... He said, oh, I just kissed your skin with my whip. He says, it wasn't that bad. You're going to have a mark tomorrow. And yeah, I was pretty proud of that mark. Good job. Did I tell you I started to like form a crush with that guy? There was something about the guy that whipped me. Really? He was just very attentive to me. And all of a sudden I started thinking, oh, is this what the submissives like about doms? There was something about him. Hmm. Speaking of whipping asses, we did go to the dungeon slash playroom after that. I love how Dark Odyssey sets up the dungeon at the hotel. They do such a fantastic job with bringing in all the equipment. And it's it is a, big enough. It's a big room. They have two rooms, really. Yeah. They have actually three rooms, I think. One is like a pure sex room and two different That's true. dungeons, yep. which have a lot of equipment in there. They have a wrestling mat. Yeah, which is sort of funny. How come we have it? We should do that one time. I don't know if that would end well. Well, let's oil our body up. Okay. Anything with, with goes. Jello? No, I don't want jello. It's sticky. I was thinking more like hot oil. Okay. Anything goes at Dark Odyssey. Everything is about fetish and kink and sexuality and exploration. Let's bring hot oil. Okay. Well, you checked out the cage and you look like a big parrot in that cage. I thought I saw a pussy <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and what else was there? There was a bunch of stuff going on. There were various mount points where people were doing rope suspensions mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of stuff going on there. In the dungeon, what did we do? Well, somebody had to be the submissive bottom so all of us doms could try out our new skills that we learned. It ended up being Miss Spencer tied up over a barrel, literally. That was pretty hot. That's because there wasn't any other space. I wanted something to either have her stand up and tie her up or to lay her over something like a spanking bench. And the barrel was calling her name. So it worked yep, out really well because we could really all cool. walk around. Yeah, how many of us were there? Like four or five people. There was a on, lot. Working on our... Yeah, that was a pretty hot scene. That was a really hot scene. That was fun. After that, what did we do? We interviewed some vendors the next day. Saturday. We interviewed Zemus, who's a whip mistress. Oh my gosh. She was the one that I was watching on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And she was double handing. She's tiny. And she had a whip in each hand. Do you remember when we were there with Miss Penzer? Yep. Did you see Zemus? I saw this woman with two whips and she was so elegant. And she just handled the whip like it was part of her body. Yeah, she dances with them. Yep. And then on Sunday... The last day, when we were checking out, I will never forget, the hotel had a technical problem and the fire alarm went off. So what that means is that everybody has to come out, regardless what state they are in. No matter what you're wearing, you have to go out on the street and be safe and wait for the firemen to clear the hotel. <laughs> it was hysterical. And remember, this is a fetish and kink event that's happening in san francisco so you can imagine the colorful people that are attending this yeah, event most the, the most naked ones they threw like some towels over them <laughs> or a bathrobe well luckily it was mid-morning it was late morning yeah but they were still like they were. Pe people with needles in them people yeah. with suspension hooks in i was them gonna say the like ropes <laughs> it was pretty hysterical watching that it was funny so that was our visit to Dark Odyssey. They come to San Francisco about every November. Well, the hosts are actually, they live here in the Bay Area. 
and they put it on once a year and looking at how it's grown over the last three years, they're probably only able to do one, one a year, but their, their goal is to do more than one, one a year. Yep. And they do have different events, different events besides Dark Odyssey as well. Right. But we'll put all those links in the show notes. Yep. So that was our review. Here are some of the interviews that we did. And we are here with Zemus, who did a fairly fabulous demo and instruction about whips. So hello. Hello. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How do you identify? Well, identify as me, not okay. n- me as saying uh, I don't identify male, female, dom, top, human. Okay, exploring. That's... I like all the aspects of those various places, whether it's the top or the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to learn to be a top. I wasn't always a top, but learning to well in the swing community, I love taking control of. Who was and making them and making them guys, it was one of my favorite things is making guys come when I wanted to make them come, and I think uh, I didn't realize that I had that top energy, and then I brought that with me. So your designation is control freak. Yeah, actually, <laughs> yes, including myself. <laughs> but I also like spontaneity. I like the both sides. I don't want to claim a label and I have to be stayed there. You're one of those bi poly switches, which I just call greedy. Well, great. Yeah, greedy. No, she's What's a I, girl that knows what she likes. I, and I top more because I can't find people to top me the way I want to be topped. Okay. <laughs> that almost sounds like a challenge, but before we go there, tell us about your whips. They're very sensual. The whips between the craftsmen of mm-hmm. making it, mm-hmm. the time that goes in, a, the shape it looks like a snake, but it's not a snake. There's a texture to it. And then the way just fly. The way they float and the grace that goes with them. But with this grace and beauty, there's also this pain or the sound that is so jarring. Mm-hmm. Again, it's the dichotomy of both sides to play. For the focus that it demands of me, I enjoy greatly because it's, it's without a challenge. I can leave and meditate. I need to focus. I need to be here. I cannot go anywhere. So, using the whip is a sort of meditation for you? Yes. How did you get started with this? I got started by watching um, Panther. I walked into a dungeon about seven years ago, and this gentleman was throwing a whip, but it wasn't as I had imagined. It wasn't striking and throwing it hard. It wasn't this whipping I'd seen on TV. It was an elegance. It was elegance. He was just dancing with it. And then I looked at the end of the whip, and there was this piece of wide fabric and I looked and he was massaging his person his bottom the way he moved and the way the whip moved and the way it touched her and that it wasn't smacking it just he did this dance his feet went and I was just enthralled in watching you were hypnotized by the sensuality totally totally the touch the uh, the atmosphere the whole connection and the bubble they made and he went with what was natural for him Mm mm-hmm I was sold. I'd seen plenty of toys, but nothing drew me as much as the whip. So that got you interested. Oh, that. totally. And I couldn't wait till uh, the gentleman I was seeing was my first dom. I couldn't wait till he left his bag so I could grab his whip. <laughs> <laughs> you stole the whip? When he wasn't home, I took the whip out and I would play with it in the backyard whenever I could. So you learned it all by yourself? Yes and no. But I had um, several teachers. I took a long six weeks class on um, BDSM by seeing the danger in it, I knew that I needed to totally educate myself to keep myself safe. And during that time, one of the guest presenters was Viper. Viper makes fabulous whips. He instructed me and then I just couldn't help but take up his time. I, I just wanted more. To me, I see in your eyes that you sort of fetishized it. I did because it's just so easy to fetishize. It, you could have such control over it. The mind fuck you could get, take with it. I Sometimes I would dress up as a perverted clown and throw the whip. <laughs> To be just totally twisted. And it allowed me to do this evil thing, but be nice with it. So is that what you're trying to teach to people these days? These days, it's, yes, the whip. All tools and all the things that they're learning come into play. big thing that I'm teaching with the whips is that it can be a vicious tool, but it offers such a delicate way of 
reacting or acting with, and then the versatility is so large. I think whips and single tails have this reputation of being mm. like really nasty, the, yes. the nastiest things in the toy bag. What do yes. you say to that? They do have that reputation. And in fact, sometimes they are. So a lot of people that their lesson is through cracking. The lessons they learn about the whip is how to crack it. The uh, circus clown crack. But the issue with cracking is there's, there's no application. You can't crack on the skin, it'll split it. The crack is actually a sonic boom. You can deaf somebody. But this is not being taught. So last night was my first experience with a whip receiving. Oh. I, don't ask me where I decided to do it. I had not ever thought about it because the sound startles me. Yes. And so anytime I'm in a dungeon and I hear the crack of the whip, it freaks me out. Mm -hmm. but last night when I was walking through the, the vendor area and they had someone just said, oh, you want to touch the whip? And I'm like, yes, I was mesmerized from a mistress standpoint. Mm -hmm. Next thing I know, I'm up against the wall with my back out to the crowd. And yeah, he was letting me touch it from a different perspective. But it was fascinating. And so here's a question for the newbies. How can you judge the distance when it's dark in those rooms? And sometimes the light is dim in the dungeons. But he did it perfectly. Most likely he didn't hit you at first. Mm -mm. Right. I felt the wind. Right. He was gauging. Is that what he was doing? Yes, you gauge um... and then you keep walking until you can feel the strike. It was almost like a crescendo. It was a little whispers. Yeah. There was no crack sounds. And right. then he started to get a little louder. And then he let me hear the crack. And it startled me, but not as badly as it had in the past. At this point, I was kind of excited when I heard it. Okay, maybe I was anticipating like, oh, shit, the next one. You know about where you are. Yeah. Everybody's at different heights. And when I go and see it, and if I say, okay, my strike is landing on the shoulder, I'm going to back up again. I might even go down on my knees. Oh. Oh, you are very elegant with the dance of the feet. I belly danced before I did the whips as my exercise because I ruined my knees with volleyball. And then when I picked up the whips, it went into dancing with the whips. Oh. And then I was doing target practice at north, south, east, west. And I, would, I actually did a girl circle outside of me. Wow. wow. Where I did two whips with four girls. You just have to watch out She's for better than Indiana there. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best way that Bottom should communicate to you since it's their first time of being touched by a whip? When I'm playing with the Bottom, I usually give them hand signals that they can use so they don't have to be verbal. I use thumbs. You thumbs up, thumbs baby. Up. If you're not able to process, you're trying to breathe a little bit faster, I have them put their hand up and let me know that they need a break, and then I break it down and I let them breathe. Oh, that's a good way. But I try, not, I try to let them stay in that yumminess. It was yummy. And then he got a little stinger. I'm like, hello. <laughs> John missed it all. I thought he was there watching it. It was my first time. I got de-virginized. There's all those chemicals that are coming out, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was excited afterwards. I, and I did have the kisses of the whips on my back all evening. And that's wonderful that he did that, that you found that person that did that. Uh, most people make them go and see everybody throwing it before they let them touch them. You know, he just he was very gentle. Oh, good. Excellent. Right. Oh, that's very good. It makes me excited when I hear somebody who does that. He was part of the leather community here in San Francisco. Oh. He, he was one of the vendors he or... Was one of the vendors. Ah. Cool. We'll find them again. <laughs> and otherwise, you'll have other volunteers, I think, to whip you. Besides, at the end of a whip, where can people find you online? On FetLife. They can find Zemis on FetLife right now. Z-E-M-I-S. Okay. People will get in touch to you that way. Okay. Thanks a lot for this. You're welcome. are here with Michael Angel all the way from Maui. Maui, Hawaii. Aloha. You brought a beep load of kilts. Tell us about them. Yeah, my company is called PD Kilts. Uh, my master and I started the company a little over a year ago, and we've been having a ball just out all over the place selling kilts to as many people that want to get dressed up. And do you make them? No, I don't. I actually work with a company that's based out of Scotland. They've been making kilts since 1902. And tell us a little bit about the different sorts of kilts, what people should look out for, and how to pick one. It's all about comfort. There are actually two different styles of kilts that I offer. I, I offer what's called an active wear kilt, which I consider to be a three-yard kilt. When we talk about a yardage in kilt, it's the when the material is laid out to make the pattern. That depends on how many pleats you're going to get in your kilt. So a three-yard kilt is lighter and more airy and more flexible, where you start getting into higher number of kilts, like four yards, five yards, six yards. They get heavier, and then they start getting more, more formal, more, not, more fancy. 
What about the materials that they come in? Um, all my kilts are made of 50-50 cotton poly. They are machine washable, but I do recommend if you can possibly go ahead and have your kilts dry clean just so that way you don't have to hassle with all the ironing and everything comes out super neat and clean when it comes back to you. I also see you do women's kilts. Yeah, I make kilts for both men and women. My women's kilts, they are, again, three-yard cotton poly kilts, and they run in sizes 28 all the way up to 48 inches in stock with a length of either 12 or 14 inches. And my men's kilts, they run in size 28 to 58 in stock from 22 to 24 inch lengths. I like the tool rings and stuff like mm -hmm. that to, to put all your yeah, equipment yeah. in. Yeah, one of my models has removable pockets so that, you know, you can fill it up and ditch it when it get hot, mm. gets hot and heavy, you know, plan yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I think we need to get you into one, Miss Cindy. Oh, you can get me in and out of them. <laughs> that's, that's half the fun is taking them off. You also yeah. have leather ones. Yeah, I do. We also do leather kilts. Again, they're three yards, 100% natural cowhide leather. Fully lined on the inside to keep the chafing down to a minimum. Nice and comfortable. I really like uh, the look of them. Yeah, they are. They are super, super nice. The quality is all there. Yeah, and the cotton is really soft. Yeah. And yeah, they're beautiful. So tell us a little bit about the differentiators between what you have here and what you see sometimes in the stores. Oh, I would probably say number one, quality. The people I've been working with, they've been making their kilts. It's a family-owned business since 1902. Wow. So I think they kind of know what they're doing by now. It's Scottish family. They know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. And so I got to ask you, and I'm sure everyone does, so are you wearing it the, the right way, natural way? The thing the... I always tell people, I, I, got, <laughs> I got your imagination up there right now. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Excellent. And so I, one last question is, is, do you find that men are really preferring to wear these on a daily basis or is it more of dressing up and going out? No, it's real casual wear. You know, a lot of guys, like one guy came in yesterday, bought specifically to work in the yard. And they you are know? very comfortable. Yeah, yeah, they're hiking, they're active, they're formal, any, anytime you want to wear one. And where can people find you on the web? My website, www.pdkilts.com. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. Shout out. This shout out goes out to Los Swingers. Hello, everyone. We are Los Swingers here. I am uh, El Señor Swinger. And I am La Señora Swinger. Not only do they podcast in Spanish and English, they also make some awesome jello shots, including some with mojitos. Mmm. Check them out at losswingers.com. Hi there. Hi. Who are you and what did you bring here? I'm Tara. I'm from KJ Canes. I came from Baltimore and I brought a variety of canes from uh, rattan, acrylic, delrin, fiberglass, aluminum. Some ones that glow in the dark? Yep. Some of them actually glow in the dark. Some of them are just blacklight reactive and some of them actually will light up independently with the use of a control pad. It's sort of like L-wire? Yes, exactly. And I actually have some that also have LED lights inside as well. In the back, you have some with like figurines on them or what yeah, is that? Those are my designer canes. They have little toppers on them and it just depends on what people really like. I have some that have cartoon characters and superhero mm -hmm. characters on them. I have some with public service and military uh, toppers on them, some with sports. I even have mm -hmm. sports. So you mentioned various compositions of canes. Why would people pick one above the other? It depends. It's mostly a style. A, 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 it's just mostly preference. Is there any difference in feeling? Oh, absolutely. Obviously, some of them are very flexible and they have a lot of spring mm -hmm. and some of them are absolutely not flexible. So if I wanted a non-flexible, for example, where would I go? Um, you would go with either carbon fiber, fiberglass, the thicker uh, like half inch Delrin, the aluminum, stainless steel, those don't, wow. yeah, those don't, uh, those don't bend. Now the acrylic ones are not made to bend either. They, they have some flexibility, but they're breakable if you use them mm -hmm. really, really heavy handedly. But the Lexan ones, which is the same stuff that airplane windows and bulletproof mm -hmm. glass is made out of, you can beat the crap out of somebody with those and they're very flexible and you can get them with lots of pretty, Colors and, uh, you know, you can get them with sparkle in them or a matte fill in them and your color. Some of them have designs, like I have the candy cane cane and I have tiger and leopard designs and just, I try to make something that speaks to everyone. That sounds fun. So where can people find out more about your canes and how can they get in touch with you? They can write to us at info at kjcanescanes.com. KJKanes.com, obviously the website, or they can follow us on Twitter at KJKanes.
Thank you very much for that. My pleasure. All right, we are here with Penny from Lust Designs, who apparently brought a whole bunch of gorgeous latex. So tell us about that, Penny. I'm based out of Oakland, so I'm local, and I was invited to do this event last year and had a fantastic time and couldn't wait to come back. So I brought uh, all sorts of fun new things this year. Tell us about your latex. Where is it made? How is it made? I work out of a live work loft in Oakland, and I have a small studio space. It's uh, mostly myself. I have a few helpers now and then when I get really busy, but it's all uh, made by me, designed by me. Uh, I do the marketing. I do the janitorial work. I do a little bit. I do pretty much everything myself. Wow. So these are all self-designed? Yes. I do get help from my awesome clients when they come to me with new and interesting ideas. So I like to work with my clients to come up with custom pieces. We have a mermaid here on the bed. Tell us about that. <laughs> How did you get that idea? Uh, the mermaid was really fun. I have a friend who uh, makes corsets at Dark Garden, and she was putting on a fun show and invited mm -hmm. me to join in with her. And she wanted to do a under the sea scene with uh, some beautiful girls in sailor outfits in her corsets. So we decided that I would come in with a mermaid. And we had a beautiful male model that has uh, gills tattooed all over his chest and beautiful underwater dolphins and sea creatures <laughs> all over his arms and back. And so I made him this amazing mermaid tail with a big boa of seaweed and he was rolled on stage on a big treasure chest by a bunch wow. of girls in sailor suits that danced around him. It was really fun. That's awesome. I'm looking at your portfolio of designs, and I noticed quite a few of the outfits have designs on them. Where do you get the materials? The designs on them are applique on. They're hand cut by me and a couple of really fantastically talented uh, artists that I have that help me out on occasion doing the appliques, and they're um, hand applique onto the latex. It's all latex, 100%. That's extremely impressive. Tell us about people who don't know latex that well. How do we care about latex? How do you get in? I think it scares a lot of people. It's a lot easier than you think. People assume that latex has to be a full cat, black catsuit, gimp suit, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I try to tell new people to, to start small, try on some panties or maybe a small skirt just to get a feel for how it feels. I love to get new people into latex and they always say, oh, I had no idea this feels so good on or I look so good in it. And uh, the main thing that people are intimidated about is getting into it. And the more fun it is to get into, the more fun it is to wear. And one of the things about latex is you get to lube up to put it on. Mm -hmm. So you lube up your body, you lube up the latex, you slide into it. Pretty much any lube you can use on a condom is fine to use for latex. I prefer silicone lube personally. Um, that's what I use. And uh, it's fun to shine up afterwards once you have it on as well. Or you can have somebody else lube you up. Exactly. That's part of the fun. <laughs> We love minions. We take good care of our gear. <laughs> yes. I noticed it doesn't matter what size of body. Someone that is wearing latex, they're beautiful. It accentuates curves. It creates curves where I didn't know I had curves. Your latex designs are really creative and they're beautiful. Thank you so much. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of known for is that um, I'm a curvy girl and that's how I got into the design is that I wanted to make clothing for myself. I've been doing this almost 10 years and back then there really wasn't a lot of choice for someone that wasn't really tiny. And so I started making my own pieces and meeting other really beautiful curvy women that were super excited to see that you can look good in latex if it fits you correctly. And so I started out making curvy latex. I didn't make anything under a size 10 or 12 for the first couple of years. Um, not being sizist, but just that that was the clients that were coming to me. Um, and then the models started getting involved and I got started doing events and um, I started making things for pretty much any size. So I can fit just about anyone. I have a pretty good eye for that. And I noticed you made this custom bowling shirt. <laughs> yes. He wanted something to wear and um, do something custom, but he didn't want to wear skin tight latex. And so we designed a bowling shirt for him that is fitted. It's still very sexy, but um, it, it, is it isn't sexy. as form fit, fitting. And I've also made a couple of pairs of pants for him as well. They aren't just skin tight leggings that they actually fit like jeans or like a pair of work pants. Um, so I like to fit your body and what you're comfortable with and what you like to wear. Well, it's all very impressive. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, I have a website. Uh, Uh, lustdesigns.com and I also have a Tumblr and a Facebook and FetLife Twitter and all that good stuff. I am Lust Designs everywhere. Hi, who are you and what did you bring here? My name is Liz and my company is Rainbow Rope and KinkyMedical.com. So I have brought all the rope you could possibly need for any bondage situation plus hardware and then we uh, also brought medical supplies and wow. safety equipment. So I see you have a lot of rainbow-colored rope. Can you tell me a little bit about the material? 
Uh, what you just picked up happens to be a synthetic product. It's multifilament polypropylene, it's abbreviated to MFP. It's similar to a nylon product, but a little easier to work with. Doesn't stretch as much, doesn't burn the skin the same way that a nylon product would, but it's easy mm -hmm. to care for. So you can wash it, you can dry it, and you can sanitize it. So you can wash it in regular washing machine? Yep, you just throw it in the washing machine like you would your dirty clothing. And how does it compare to the more natural hemp and, and others? The main difference is that it's not going to hold a knot quite as well. It's going to slip a little bit. Mm -hmm. But people get used to working with it. It's a good starter rope because it's significantly less expensive than a natural mm -hmm. fiber rope. And it's easier to care for. So if you're playing with a lot of different people, it's easier to clean than a natural product is. True. If you're doing decorative bondage versus suspension bondage, is there one sort of rope over the other that you would pick? No, they both work just fine. You can use either a natural fiber or a synthetic fiber for either decorative or uh, suspension work. A uh, synthetic rope is going to have a rated tensile strength. So you actually get a factory tested tensile strength. Whereas with a synthetic rope, you're just going on a guess. Yep, yep. Because everyone is handmade and different, I guess. Correct. Tell me a little bit about the other stuff that you brought. Uh, the other things I brought are medical supplies and some safety equipment. So we bring scissors, emergency shears, in case you're playing with rope, you need to cut someone out. Uh, we also bring disinfectants and, uh, and gloves as a safety product for the medical instruments. Yeah, I was just wondering what these things are. I mean, it's sort of hard to describe. It looks like it's a planet constellation. So <laughs> That is an insertable tuning fork. It's made of solid uh... stainless steel. So once you have it inserted, you can get it vibrating and you can feel the vibrations that way. You can insert the either end. So if you insert at that end, or you can insert the balls, one vaginally and one anally, and then you but can then feel the vibrations. But then how do you get it to sound? Do you you hit, use which a, part do you hit? You use a rubber hammer, and you just give a slight tap to it, and it starts it vibrating. Oh, okay. This sounds like very scientific to me. <laughs> and what's all this scary stuff? Those metal rods are commonly referred to as sounds, and they are most commonly used for urethral dilation. Uh, what else did you bring? Oh, we brought uh, speculums. Mm -hmm. We brought TENS units, which are a great... This is to control radar, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's to make you vibrate, honey. Oh, okay, I see. And, 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 and even brought a ray gun. There you go. A suction ray gun. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> what do you do with these things? I think they are used to make cupcakes. To make cupcakes? Well, I don't know if the plastic would hold up in the oven, but they're great for sucking up the naughty bits. Uh-huh, and you just leave them on, you put them on there, and then you suck the air out, and then you just leave them on? Is you that do, how it works? You do leave them on so that you can yank and pull and slide and keep that suction for a little bit of extra sensation. Mr. Cindy is already sniffing the rope. She's sniffing my hemp. <laughs> She's a little bit of a hemp slut. Where can people find you on the internet? We are rainbowrope.com and also kinkymedical.com. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, who are you? I'm Samantha Griffin with The Kink Shop. And what all nice toys did you bring here? The majority of it's impact, but we cover everything from light and fluffy to mean and nasty. We got some single tails that uh, we make ourselves. The majority of them are 12 plat, shot loaded. And then we have rattan canes that these two paws right here make. These particular uh, rattan canes, what's special about them? Why would people pick that instead of anything else? Ours in particular, they all go through the same process, which is when we get it in, I clean the rattan, I sand it, I oil it, and I use a marine varnish to finish them off, multiple coats, at least four, and they come with a guarantee. You break one of our canes, we replace it. Behind you, I see there one of the first things that even we bought at Folsom Street Fair. The finger floggers, they are one of our first items we started making. Oh gosh, I think Max started making them about 18 years ago, and I can make them in my sleep now. It's one of our favorite toys. It was one of the missus's favorite toys as well. Yeah, they're very awesome. They actually hold on to you instead of you having to hold on to them. Okay, can you tell us a little bit for listeners what the difference between them and... Uh, we have multiple... Uh, Types, we have everything from suede, deer tan, which is very soft. It's a nice warm-up flogger. We have the combos, which have a little rubber mixed in with the deer tan. It gives it a little afterbite, a little sting. And then we have all rubber over here. The best thing about them is for a novice, they're really easy to pick mm -hmm. up and use right off the bat. Yeah, and they have this rotating system. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's steel ball bearings inside of a swivel. That's part of the reason that a novice can pick them up and go right to town. Mm-hmm. What about some of the other gear that you have? We've got the Tzappers, which are always a favorite. Uh, yeah, that, that shit hurt. 
<laughs> oh, please. I'm an electric slut. I love both ends of that one yeah, myself. Actually, it, it actually made marks on me where I'm, I'm, I'm right. quite used to the, the violet wand, but those things make marks if you drag them. Yeah. Um, I hadn't tried those out before. And you have a nice arsenal of whips. Uh, yeah, we actually make all our single tails ourselves. They're 12 plat, like I was saying, shot loaded, which means it has a nylon bag in it with steel shot. They're all double bellied. What does that mean? That means it's uh, the shot bag and it's braided over it twice. So you oh, okay. see the top layer and there's two under it. Awesome. Where can people find you on the web? Thekingshop.com. Don't forget the the. Thekingshop.com. We're out of uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, but we ship everywhere. Thank you for that. Thank you. Give me your balls. <laughs> Heard that on my honeymoon. Oh, I love the smell. We are here with Scott, who has a whole bunch of buzzing toys. What do you want to learn about a violet wand today? So what did you all bring here? Well, that crackling that you just heard is a violet wand. It's a modern interpretation of a vintage medical quack electrode device meant to cure everything from lumbago to... Uh, hair loss. Is, hair is, loss, yes. People have heard about the Violet One before, but you make a couple of unique attachments. We at Big Head Studio make fantastic attachments. We innovate a lot of new things. We've got flexible electrodes. We've got custom shapes and colors that no one before has ever had. We even innovated a bicolor electrode. 100 years of Violet One play, no one has ever had a red-blue combo. Oh, that's very patriotic. Very, very proud, very proud of it. And yeah, we have Mistress Cindy in the meantime in the background playing with these. With myself. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? Well, we make light bulb adapters that convert a standard household light bulb into an electrode. So it's a cheap alternative and you get a lot of variety. We also have a light bulb adapter for not just standard light bulbs, but for the much smaller candelabra-based light bulb. So you can go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's, and with one of our adapters, you can turn any light bulb you find into a special electrode. I think the small ones fit Christmas lighting, right? Yes, the small candelabra size base. That's awesome for the season. And you've managed to convert like little uh, neon kettle prods onto a direct attachment? Yeah, we're actually the only folks out there who figured out a way to mechanically connect and electrically isolate it so that we've got a spark gap for safety. And it looks like a fluorescent tube on the outside, but it acts as a kettle prod on the tip and you can use the entire side of it for a, uh, a more diffused sensation, but it's still got some bite. Describe this. Oh, what we see in front of us now, folks, is a Wartenberg wheel that's been specially adapted with our special spark gap for safety. Usually with a violet wand, you would use this as an indirect toy. I could connect you to the machine, send high frequency over your body, and then by hand holding a Wartenberg wheel, you can get a shock, and it's nasty. Yes. I still have the marks from two days ago. Oh, what we're demoing here is we've got... Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> it's a party here. Here at Dark Odyssey, um, we figured out a way to adapt a violet wand to connect directly with the Wartenberg wheel. Oh, that's awesome. That is so evil. <laughs> it amps up the power by a factor of like 10. It's rather insane. You could brand someone with this if you wanted to. Yeah. I've, I've never had branding with a violet well, wand before until now. Well, you've got delicate now. polka dots running up and down your arm now. That is so awesome. I'm not sure we should that leave her so unattended fast. with this. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, I'm Scott Bighead on FetLife. Send me an email. We can answer all of your Violet Warren questions and uh, help you out with any yeah, information you need to know. Oh, a question. You uh, in the rear? <laughs> Differentiator between your toys and what you see out in the market. be honest with you, the Violet Wand world is designed to fuck you in the ass and take your money. I believe in transparency and clarity. We don't lie about our product. We don't misrepresent our product. A true Violet Wand is a true Violet Wand. It's not a high-frequency Asian import device. It's not a beautician's device. It's not a solid state. A solid state Violet Wand is not a Violet Wand. Yeah. If you stick with this 100-year-old uh, technology, it's built in a modern way, but it's an old technology, you'll be satisfied. A real Violet Wand will last you 80 years with ease. It'll take all the accessories, and you'll just be happier in the long run with it. Indeed. We're both big Violet Wand fans. We love zapping. I like zapping balls with my tongue. Okay, you guys are clearly oh, perverted. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Good chatting with you folks. And that's all that we have time for today. You can find all the details in our show notes at bulletsbringers.com. There's also a brand new calendar there, so you can view yourself where exactly the Bliss team will strike next. Also, while you're there, leave us a review on iTunes by going to itunes.blissbringers.com. 
first person to post a review gets a one-year membership on Lifestyle Lounge, courtesy of the Blissbringer team. Join us next time when we join the captain and the professor for more naughty adventures. All names mentioned in this show are either fictional, taken from public record, or held by people who have given their explicit consent to be mentioned.